Hello and welcome to the Applied Improvisation Network Brain Tank number three. This is number three in a series of what are think tank meetings to consider the current and future state of applied improvisation and the place within that of the Applied Improvisation Network. We have a plan for a conversation of maybe 30, 45 minutes, depending how it goes today. And if you are watching this on recording or participating in it live, you can also join in with a Google document, which was promoted and posted with all the notifications about the event. And I can share that as well in the chat. There's the Google Doc. Starts on page 12, the session three section, although pages one to 11 are very interesting to read as well. Our topic for today is how applied improvisation has developed and been tested in the humanitarian sector. And we, guests on our, we have guests on our panel of Belina Raffi and Margot Curl, and everyone else who's here, uh, Frederic so far. So very welcome. And we'll start by inviting each to say a little bit about your connection to applied improvisation and your connection to the humanitarian sector. Maybe just briefly by way of introductions. Um, Belina, do you want to start? Sure, um, thanks. So excited to be here with you gorgeous people. Um, in terms of applied improv, I think my first applied improv book that I read was by Robert Lowe, Improvisation Inc. I started my company in 2007, um, met you, Paul, and said, please be my business partner, teach me everything you know. <laughs> um, and um, back, I just looked it up in 2000, I started using improv for sustainability professionals and things like that, because I saw that the mindsets of collaboration, dealing with the emergent, playfulness even though the the topics were serious that the the process of playfulness was really useful um, and i met the fabulous pablo suarez from the red cross climate center in may 2012 at a degrowth conference and what was really irritating was we were put at the same time and his was like the one other session from that conference that i really wanted to see and we ended up talking later and i um sort of lovingly stalked him for two years to say, please come to one of our conferences. And then kind of, we got to do more and more. And we got to, I got to meet the fabulous Margo. So that's, maybe that's a little brief uh, intro. That's a great start, thank you. Uh, Margo, what's your connection to the humanitarian world and the world of applied improvisation? Yeah, well, thank you for the uh, short introduction there, Belina. Always great to be referred to as fabulous before you even start talking. So thank you. Um, no, it's, so I have worked in the humanitarian sector for years now. I work for the Red Cross Red Cross and Climate Centre, um, <clears throat> which is a reference centre for the global Red Cross Red Crescent movement. And it deals with um, the impacts, addressing the impacts of climate change. So how can we make sure that people suffer less in a nutshell, um, knowing that the climate is changing? Now, I think um, uh, Belina captured it really nicely when she said, you know, it's even though we're dealing with entirely different topics, a lot of the processes that we are dealing with um, can really benefit from uh, applied improvisation. I think that's what we've seen over the last years. Um, I was just thinking, what was my first introduction? And I'm not actually really sure because I've met so many of you over the years. Um, and uh, I, th I think, Belina, what you said is teach me everything you know. I've always felt that. <laughs> in the presence of uh, applied improvisation um, uh, facilitators, moderators, um, so have had a lot of that and is of course <clears throat> And what you mentioned, Pablo has brought it to the Climate Centre. And I think it's really started from, you know, working with little exercises to really shaping the way um, we, we moderate processes, we design processes uh, with lots of different stakeholders, you know, governments, researchers, um, bringing everyone together and really talking about difficult topics and doing that in a way where everyone feels energised and uh, have an effective session. So that's a, a bit of my introduction. Thank you, Margot. And Frederic? Okay, well, 
my first uh, introduction to Impro, I must say that first I started to learn theater, to learn German when I arrived in Germany. And then I, I, I fall in love with Impro theater and I say, oh, that's great. I'm sure we can use that professionally. So I did some research and then I found, yes, there is a group, the Applied Impro Network, and I attended one of the AN uh, conference. I, I can't remember if it was in 2006, seven or eight, uh, where we met, so quite a long time ago. Um, and, and then I used that, uh, I was self-employed, I used um, uh, applied improvisation for, for different uh, team building mainly, but uh, also developing skills. Um, and then I must say, I, I was yeah, completely dragged out of that. So always interested in uh, applied improvisation, but not really using it. Although I'm working in change and learning uh, environment. So it's really topics where we can really use it. Um, from the humanitarian world, I'm not directly involved, uh, working in a big, huge company, uh, but my daughter, uh, she, she worked for the, um, for the food bank in, in London. So, uh, so I'm aware, and she's uh, doing a, a master in um, uh, political environmental, environmental politics, and she's really, her topic is uh, social justice and all these, uh, these topics. So, through that, um, I mean, I was interested before, but even more now. So, and when I saw your, your post, and it was completely by chance, Paul, because the last few months I was not on LinkedIn a lot. And I saw that, I said, okay, that's a good way to get back to the topic. So thanks for the invitation in LinkedIn and thanks for this occasion. Welcome back. And my connection is with the Applied Improvisation Network as a co-founder back in the beginning of the century and being involved with it ever since. And some of the most exciting things that we've done have been our interactions with the humanitarian sector, both AIN to Red Cross and um, at that organizational level, and also individual work that I've done as facilitator and designer for anything from COP climate talk sessions to um, working on insurance, new ideas and social justice, social protection and um, prevention of sexual, sexual exploitation and abuse. So some really profound and important things that this maybe seemingly frivolous idea of improvisation or improv can lend itself to. And it's a question that I've been thinking about recently is, is there, a particular overlap of um, improvisation having a, a particularly good fit for the humanitarian sector? Because you could say that applied improvisation offers things like good facilitation and a neat set of activities, and that that would be useful for accountants, bankers, and any other sector. They could all do with better meetings and a bit more fun and ways of engaging with people and using games as a means of learning. But that kind of diminishes our worth as a subset of participatory activities and experiential learning. Is there something more profound that connects applied improvisation and its possibilities with the humanitarian sector? I'm going to go to Belina again first for that. Right. Marco, you catch anything I miss. <laughs> so I, have, I absolutely... Yes, I, I mean, I think we're all here because yes, but it, it, specifically, I think it's a, a mindset and a practice of under pressure, dealing with the emergent, accepting and building on what's actually happening and trying to navigate that with a solution focused mindset of like, what can we use to move the story forward, particularly tilted in a, in a way that keeps people safe, that that um, is adjusting quickly if circumstances change. So I, I really feel like improv in particular is beautifully suited <laughs> for humanitarian as like the extreme application because it's it's designed to help us when we're afraid to be grounded, connected and generous. So is it that the humanitarian sector presents very 
big problems, including emergencies, that demand a, a particular way of approaching them and dealing with them in the moment, emergent, adaptable, and those sorts of things. And we've, I suppose we've all had some taste of that over the last year when our plans in comfortable Western world were suddenly disrupted to points that we just hadn't imagined possible beforehand. And while that may not have been as extreme or difficult as many of the humanitarian crises and challenges, it, it's given us a flavour of that. And we've all been improvisational in our response. So it's foregrounded the, the skills and attitudes, mindsets and, and techniques that might be best suited for us dealing with that kind of thing. Margot? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I um, I would agree with what Valina has said. Um, I do think that that's you know a subset of the humanitarian world. So that's very much sort of the the emergency work, the the people in in <laughs> not their Superman capes, but you know they're 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 running around in 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 high vis vests um, and dealing with um, with, with uh, disasters as they're happening and dealing with decisions quickly, having to you know make make those decisions very quickly and, and having that mindset of using everything that's going on. I think it can be extremely helpful in in that situation. Um, the work I'm personally involved with would be more on the longer term processes where there's less of that pressure cooking, uh, pressure cooker sort of um, vibe going on, even though, you know, there's obviously there's a huge overarching emergency that we need to work towards, but the processes themselves um, have the possibility of taking a bit longer. Uh, but within that, what, why I think this is particularly well suited is, um, is, is I think what I said before is um, that very often um, we're dealing with bringing uh, different sets of stakeholders together in really complex dialogues. Um, and <clears throat> it's very easy for processes like that for people to stay in their own corners and you know not speak each other's language not get to the core of something and really stay separate um, and I think what, uh, what what I've understood from applied improvisation so far and the processes that we've um, designed you know using your experience and expertise and uh, and, and and having tools at hand um, I, I think really help us soften those differences, bringing people together and, and really come to a process of co-creation um, that can you know, start to address really complex issues. So I think that's for, for me, especially where there's a, a beautiful fit. Mm. Let, let's talk about Pablo Suarez <laughs> a bit more. Talking because... about complex processes, no. Yeah. <laughs> he, he made me eat bugs. <laughs> I think he made all of us eat bugs. <laughs> a, a dangerous man in many respects. <laughs> but uh, he saw these possibilities that Bellina put in front of him. And I've quoted a couple of his emails from um, five, eight years ago in the Google Doc, where he says how inspired he was by coming to the Applied Improvisation Network conference, first in Berlin, 2015, no, 2014 or 13. And then again, and we'll talk about what he did in Canada, in Montreal, and that he immediately saw the possibility of applying the some of the ideas that he got as a way of making better connection, better connection. in the way that you've just way, described, you just Margaret. described Margaret. I'm getting an echo. Uh, Frederick, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And he did this by, instead of doing a conventional talk, he did activities and engaged people in it so that they were speaking at least from the same experience of that activity. And by doing something different and unusual, it also got the attention. And I know that the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Centre has developed, both before that and subsequently, a suite of games and activities and exercises which are leaning towards being more improvisational in the sense of they don't require so much kit or setup and they're not as complicated. They're easier to play with different numbers on the spur of the moment and get messages across. And that they 
teach concepts. They give people the idea of what something is about and they teach some skills while you're doing the activity, you're learning how to do something like talk more clearly to your neighbor or notice more of what's going on or change direction quickly in a physical activity. It can be as simple as that or can be much more complex and layered. So that whole development of games went on. And he also had the idea which he brought to the conference in Montreal that some of the things that we thought were important stuff to say in the world of applied improvisation didn't land well in the real world. <laughs> you couldn't just go with a message of yes and without some interpretation and contextualization. That talking about failures and mistakes doesn't go down well when those failures and mistakes are failures of life and important resource systems and huge amounts of, of spending. So that really helped to make a differentiation between what you might do in a workshop with safety of a theatre environment and what you might teach in a workshop that's supposed to apply to the real world. And that's really at the heart of what applied improvisation is about. So I've, I've rambled a bit there. But <laughs> maybe you've got some comments on any aspects of, of that. Ask Margot to go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe Margot would like to go first this time. I'm so spontaneous. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I recognize all of what you're seeing here. And, and I think I was actually there at one of the AIN conferences in, in, in England, in Oxford, in I don't know what year, 26 maybe, where, uh, where Pablo had a really impactful session bringing this point across about the dangers of yes and in a humanitarian situation that we can't say yes to every, everything, but sometimes it's a hard no <clears throat> where there's safety of um, others' consents. So I, I, that's, you know, I, I still almost that feeling comes <laughs> to, the, it, 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 it like comes up in my chest thinking about that session, thinking that there, there are really some things um, in terms of framing to think about. Oh, I hear myself double as well now. Um, when, when it comes to the whole point that you're talking about, um, uh, using games and activities um, to uh, make more impacts and get messages across. I, I think that's um, not something that's new. That's been, we started to do that for years and years and years. And that's, you know, evolved from all sorts of activities where we're looking at the probabilities of extreme weather events changing. So really technical things and then decision-making under pressure and taking people through that experience to much simpler um, uh, activities where there's lower level of skill um, required as a facilitator, much more broadly applicable and really triggers interesting thinking. Um, I don't know if uh, it, one of the things that comes to mind is a snap sort of thing. Yeah, 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 Belina's doing it. <laughs> like an imaginary deck of cards <clears throat> and then you know if you say the same number the first person to say snap gets a point and gets the deck of cards and then you can sort of apply that by then bringing in content it could be any content so it could be what do you think about when you think about climate change or whatever the topic is that you want to explore in that particular meeting workshop setting um, at that time and I think um for for me and for the organization is being equipped with a whole lot of these tools and approaches that you can pull out of your <laughs> quiver you know whenever applicable to soften the process to make people more engaged and um, has just been extremely helpful over the years and, and people you know come back years after saying I remember that and I remember thinking what happened and uh, yeah, the level of engagement's just uh, really gone up and, and I think especially if you're talking about something like climate change which is you know not necessarily the most exhilarating topic because we're talking about processes that gone for years or decades and um, so to 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 make people engage with that um, I think things really important uh, and, and I think having the tools to do that yeah has been very valuable. Mm. Did you want to go second Belina? <laughs> That's all right I I I think that's exactly right. And it's it's not only that the, the climate process is so drawn out, it's that it's urgent and scary. And I think there's something about navigating our, our way together joyfully 
in connection with something that is scary and very easy to kind of block out because it's too overwhelming. There's there's real power in that. Um, I feel the need to backtrack and, and explain just quickly why uh, Pablo made us eat bugs and it's related to <laughs> the thing which is yeah. it, which been really magical about working with Margo with with Pablo with the, with the team is that from the AIS side and I used to be on the board of uh, for six years uh, working with with Paul and stuff is that is seeing how beautifully you take exercises and really embed them into the different processes. So it's the how is beautifully fit with the what you're trying to do. So, so I, I remember there were several kind of uh, pilot workshops, like let's play games and let's work out what are these doing? Because it's never about just playing a game. It's always, we're gonna pick a specific game so that certain mindsets are triggered, certain behaviors are triggered. And um, so the how is part of the what, because the, the traditional, both in corporate and NGO land of death by PowerPoint is such a waste and we don't have time to waste. We need more effective meetings that people are really co-creating solutions. And the reason he made us eat bugs was this beautiful session he did right before lunch. So we were all really <laughs> hungry. And um, he talked about, we all care about the environment and here, he had an uh, somebody from The Economist spell out, like, here's the impact of different types of meat that a lot of people eat on the environment. And here's the impact if we eat really nutritious bugs. And he had <laughs> this gourmet chef that he uh, brought in to cook these delicious things. And then there were like chocolates with bugs on them and stuff. And he had people serve them to every single table and basically put your mouth where your values are. Like, like be aligned. And I think that there's something about applied improv being very mindful of body and mindset and actions, which helps us to align the how with the what in a particularly good way. Um, yeah, and that's why he made us eat bugs is to say like, okay, if you care about this, here is something that's outside of your comfort zone, <laughs> which is actually applicable. Like you can do this. Um, yeah, and that felt very like with improv. The message is wrapped up in the design of the activity, Absolutely. literally in the case of bugs in chocolate. <laughs> yes. And so for facilitators, for applied improvisers who are facilitating, we need to know what the game is teaching. It's very easy to take a game and think it's teaching one thing, and it, the mechanics end up having it teach the opposite. Um, I won't give examples now because maybe it's <laughs> not the time for it. But you've uh, prompted me to think of some highlights of this relationship between the applied improvisation and the humanitarian world. Because, it, for example, it's not just working with people who are the workers in the humanitarian world. It's sometimes working with the populations themselves, the displaced villagers and so forth. I'm thinking of work that's been done in um, Manila, if I get that right, and on the borders of Mexico and America, where the improvisational activity is participated in by people who have been affected by um, some other, some humanitarian difficulty or other. Um, so with that whole range of things in mind, what, what are some of your highlights of that relationship where it's, it's worked well, been effective and, and memorable for you? Margot, you're nodding slightly more vigorously. <laughs> Start with you. Yes. <laughs> um, no, it's it's. I, I'm just thinking. You know, it, um, uh, for me personally, I I have well. I'm just thinking, have I used this sort of thing? Has the organization used these um, in, in, uh, on the front line? And, and most certainly, I would say yes. Um, we've run all sorts of um, training of trainer sessions using games and activities for people in, in all sorts of countries um, to, you know, to, to really get um, to the population level, uh, create contingency plans uh, for disaster preparedness using activities and really getting people to think sharply, cleverly, quickly on what's needed rather than having a sit down process that 
takes a, a long time. So, so certainly have used that over the year, over the years. Um, and and I think one other highlight for me that comes to mind immediately now is, um, in addition to, you know, having used um, the applied pre improv principles and uh, tools in in uh, the design and facilitation of things um, and, and supporting others to in their design and facilitations gotten to that level. I think partly because of the experience we've we've learned from the network from the applied improvisation side of things. So, so really people come to us now for, hey, um, how can we do this in a more effective, more interesting way? So that's interesting. Um, and uh, we've had the pleasure of uh, together with uh, Melina, with Paul, with some other colleagues uh, creating an online course actually <clears throat> called Participate. Um, where we look at um, the effective the design um, and facilitation of um, effective meetings in face to face meetings um, and have had fantastic response uh, to that where you really take um, participants um, for free through principles activities things tips and lessons on, on what we've learned over the years of uh, how can we do this better and that's been a, a real highlight for me. Mm -hmm. um, for you, Belina? I mean, Co-creating the, the Participate program was awesome. Um, we also did a session in the Paris conference, um, like a pre-session that was looking at humanitarian and applied improv and, and learned a lot <laughs> through delivering that as well. Um, Gabe Mercado is, is the one you were talking about in the Philippines, and I got to visit him several years ago and, and really talk about he was working with um, Mary Tiskovich, who was at FEMA at that point. And a year after the biggest um, typhoon, they went and worked with effective, affected communities on how do we make better decisions if it happens again. And I remember him saying very like extremely moving things of asking the participants in the morning, like if it happens again, how um, confident are you that you're going to make Good decisions and some of them were at the level of if it happens again and this is even a year later i don't want to make it i, I want to go like that that's how um traumatized they were and by the end of it they were saying that was brilliant and now we feel more confident that we know what to do if it happens again um and we're ready to do that so that was an incredibly moving um project that that gabe and mary did so the, the practice of improvisation in a workshop setting is giving people life skills to be more in touch with their resources and to improvise better responding to the, the, the needs that they have. So at its core, it's a really important skill for anyone and everyone. Again, as we've all experienced recently, at least a flavour of that and that the recognition that, they, that these are core skills that people need is going to support more of that, this sort of work happening. Um, I mentioned also the Oxford conference, the AIN conference, where we had two days of meeting between the uh, humanitarian attendees and applied improvising attendees to really talk about some of these things, get to understand each other's worlds and, and develop some activities together that was one of the highlights for me um what questions and thoughts have sprung to anyone's mind frederick included while we've been speaking no thoughts have sprung to anyone's <laughs> mind <laughs> okay. what, what the, uh, uh, frederick if you have something you can tell us no no um, i uh, but I, had, uh, I, I, had, I, I, I was I'm really interested in all what, what you say and uh, I mean from from my experience on applied improvisation I can really see what you what you've done and uh, I, I I've seen a video um, from some time ago I think I don't know where it was po posted but uh, from uh, Pablo Surar is what what you were talking about and um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, no, I don't have a specific question at the moment, or oh, too many. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's I, fine. Thank you. I have a reflection of now that we've been through various 
levels of lockdown and uh, third waves and for you know, like all these different waves of pandemic that the ambient stress for us around the world has been incredibly high mm-hmm. to the point where like cognitive function is beginning to fray a little bit um, our ability to do zoom conferences so there's I'm appreciating the joyful connections even when we're highly stressed aspect mm-hmm. of applied improv more and more there's something a lot of people that I'm talking to are like beyond the point of pretending um, and they really want to have real conversations and they want to have joyful connections and not like happy clappy connections but like real meaningful nurturing connections and I, I think applied improv also lends itself to that um, in a, having gone through the pandemic for over a year now I'm, I'm curious what Margot kind of sees if you guys work under stress normally and then you have the pandemic stress on top of that sort of what's your experience oh and i see we have a new participant (laughs) hi sorry i just finished another session in the us that's all right (laughs) welcome that's okay welcome and i'm going to mute you for the moment (laughs) that's a very warm welcome (laughs) um yeah, we're just talking uh, uh, quickly here. We, we went, I think, through, uh, you know, where humanita- the humanitarian world and applied improvisation um, have met, can meet. Um, and a quick reflection here from Belina on um, the, the extra levels of stress that COVID has brought um, and how we've experienced that. Um, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's a very interesting setting. Um, I feel that the first month or two, everyone was swimming and it, it was all chaotic and no one knew how to organize themselves at home and there were children running around. And <laughs> so, so it seems there was just absolute chaos for about a month or two. And then to me, it felt like the work pressure just went incredibly up. It just, um, and it's because the whole world, I mean, I've been working from home for years and years already. So very used to that. But then everyone else was and planning in meetings and meetings and meetings. I don't know if you recognize this, but all of a sudden I seem to not be able to breathe from eight in the morning till three in the afternoon or something. And then you can get to your emails and then to actually some work. And there was just that constant pressure. And I think people felt under pressure to keep delivering the same amount of stuff. So where there's a workshop organized in real life, then now it's got to be the same amount of time and online and <laughs> just this huge pressure rather than really to taking a step back and seeing all right what's the actual objective that we want to achieve and can we do that in a much shorter different um gentler way and uh, so I have certainly felt that in my work but I don't think that's necessarily representative for the humanitarian work and I think that's probably a bit of what everyone's experiencing for everyone there's this opportunity to rethink what we do and rethink the ways in which we do it and that the creativity of improvisational approaches can provide some answers and some radically different ways of doing things who do we all need to be at these meetings how can we use asynchronous communication more effectively how does going online suddenly give us access to so much more widespread expertise even if we're losing certain things at the same time of human connection and there's these are all in my view improvisational related questions with good improvisational responses from principles of collaboration and principles of taking care of, our, of ourselves and each other. I mean, maybe just to add to that, one one thing that has certainly come um, about in, in the organisation I work for, so um, Alice and I, I work for the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre, dealing with the impacts of climate change um, around the world. Um, is the whole launch of this thing called Virtually Amazing. And the cool thing, Belina, is I think you are probably one of the people who's coined that in Paris, <laughs> uh, your genie, who, uh, where there was an applied improvisation workshop um, in collaboration with the humanitarian side um, on how to work more effectively online. Um, and we've really taken that Virtually Amazing on board as a way of working. Um, and really, um, I, I foresee long into the future, um, uh, seeing, you know, can we prevent uh, meetings? Like, do we have to fly everywhere in the world? Can we reduce that? Can we not only, you know, 
make better use of our time, but also uh, not fly around the world and uh, keep polluting um, at the same time. So have a, a, a smarter, more effective way um, where we really make use of the possibilities that uh, the internet is um, offering us. So that's been really cool. If improvisation at its most basic level, <laughs> make, making use of what we've got in a better ways, creative novel ways, responding to the pressures that we're under, then making use of the world's resources seems like a very good idea. So um, I think we'll close in a, a minute or two. Final thoughts, Belina? No, 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 I don't. I don't um, I, I, I'm glad you're having this conversation. I, I, I think it's a beautiful application for so many reasons to bring applied improv to the humanitarian sector. It just to boost personal resilience of the people who are in it, um, who are having, you know, like important uh, strategic meetings and or on the ground and everybody in between. Um, it's a sector that's dear to my heart <laughs> and I'm like here to help as I can um, and I feel really honored to be part of this you know like the AIN that has I feel like what you co-founded Paul um, a million years ago whenever it actually was um, <laughs> um, you've been you've been training people for now and beyond it, like the stuff that you were planting seeds for uh, decades ago in different forms is helping people now and is going to continue to help people through climate adaptation, you know, disaster risk reduction, all sorts of other things. So it's just a joy to be part of the, the conversation in the group. <laughs> Thank you. Margot, final thought for now? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I think it's been an honour and a pleasure over the last years to to work together. I think uh, one of my highlights, I, I can't remember which AI <laughs> event this was, uh, but there was this famous Canadian man uh, who uh, was there as well from uh, whose, whose line is it anyway, I think, or um, anyway. Oh, mockery? Colin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in, in a recent um, uh, AI event. And that was the only event that week after a whole string of Zoom meetings, Teams meetings, whatever meetings, that really made me laugh out loud. Um, <laughs> and it just felt so, especially at the time where there's such pressure and there's so much going on, felt really elated. And I think giving yourself the freedom to pause and to breathe in and to be inspired literally um what was fantastic and and uh, yeah i think this uh, is a fantastic um reminder uh being here with with you guys and um, to that we've done some really cool things in the past and there's uh, plenty to be explored in the future so really looking forward to that thank you there is plenty to be explored in the future and you can get involved if you're watching this and want to be involved with the AIN, the Applied Improvisation Network, either through our Facebook group or our LinkedIn group, or through the website, which is currently under refurbishment. But if you're watching this in centuries to come, it will be <laughs> up and running, I'm sure. And there's a dedicated body of applied improvisation for humanity within the applied improvisation network which still meets from time to time and makes things like the webinar that margot's just referred to happen and these brain tank sessions looking at applied improvisation in its various facets and appearances happens on the first the second tuesday of each month at this time whatever that time is for you uh, utc <laughs> time so thank you all very much for being here today and watching this session i'm going to pause the recording now so that we can all say what we really think <laughs>